All right, so uh, let's get started then. So we have uh, Nithya Ruff. She's our featured guest today. Uh, she is the executive director of the Open Source Office at Comcast uh, and also serves as the chair of the Linux Foundation Board of Directors. Um, and some of the things she does, she promotes Linux and open source adoption both inside of Comcast and out in the community. Uh, and she also works on improving the diversity of open source contributors, increasing overall digital equity with underserved populations, and finding ways to increase the role of women in the technology workforce. So welcome, Nithya. We're glad to have you. Very good to be here, Ken. Thank you. Great. All right. So let's talk a little bit. So 15 years ago, you know, we used to have people ask us questions like, you know, why open source? Why Linux? And, you know, why can't you just license Windows and Visual Studio and be done with it, you know? And we always had to fight back against that. Um, now, you know, we know innovation happens in open source and Linux, but let's go back to what it was like when the vast majority of software we use was closed. What was it like for you when you first encountered open source concepts when you were working in commercial software, you know, uh, platforms? That's really a great question because we forget, right? It's been 30 years of Linux and now it's everywhere in our phones and our systems, and it's kind of the default operating system. So it's easy to say, gosh, when was there ever a time that, that this wasn't around? And I remember in the early days, I used to work in open source in 1998, back in the day when uh, you know companies like HP and Sun and others were beginning to acknowledge that Linux was a serious contender to the proprietary operating systems like uh, IREX, which SGI had. And most of the time, uh, Linux would come in in the form of print drivers and system drivers uh, into the organization through system administrators. And often nobody knew that it was there. And then suddenly someone would discover that we now had something with a very different looking license and then the lawyers would get involved and would say, uh, what's this doing? And then they would study the license. And then, you know, people started acknowledging, hey, look, we can't stop this tide from coming in. We just need to uh, understand how to manage the licenses, how to bring this in. And frankly, uh, that's when companies like SGI and HP and Sun said, I think our customers want uh, servers based on Linux. Uh, and so we do have to start shipping Linux based products on x86 um, because the cost effectiveness of those and the performance was getting really good. Um, so yes, at one time it was taboo, but now it's everywhere. <laughs> And you, uh, early on, I think you would, you said you had interacted with uh, the Free Software Foundation and Richard Stallman, right? Was that part of that project where the company interacted with him to try to figure out what the licenses meant and things like that? Is that kind of the angle? You know, um, the, the, I, there are two nods I, said, I suspect I, I need to make to the Free Software Foundation and also mm -hmm. GNU, right? Um, we would not have Linux without GNU. And GNU came into being uh, in 1984. And then Linus released his kernel in 1991. So we had the marriage of the two, which became you know, the Linux operating system. So of course, Stallman and the Free Software Foundation are really credited with creating the GPL license, which led to all of us having the full freedoms and access to software. I did have an opportunity, as you mentioned, in um, I believe in 2000 to talk to Richard Stallman because I was working at a company called Tripwire and we wanted to open source Tripwire for Linux. And, and one of our questions was what license should we use? And um, I made a call to Richard just to check with him to see um, you know, why GPL. And of course his recommendation was GPL. Um, yeah. And I think GPL is credited with why Linux is everywhere today. I mean, if it had not chosen that license, we would not have Linux everywhere. Yeah, because it, it, everyone had to contribute back their innovations to the software. And so, you know, if you're going to do something on top of a base, the base needs to be steady and stable, and it needs to expand over time to incorporate the services you need. 
Um, and so it certainly seems to make sense for the lower layers of something for it to be, you know, maybe more share alike and, you know, improved by many people. Um, and so that makes sense to me, but a lot of companies were resisting doing anything in actual GPL licensing, right? Because of the viral nature of it. I, I, I think um, it's because there's so many gray areas around what the best way to use GPL is with your proprietary code. And so uh, because of those gray areas, uh, companies are concerned about using um, it in conjunction with you know, their proprietary work. Um, but, but the education and the information around licenses today is so much more mature. There's a lot of great information and organizations like the Open Compliance uh, Summit, you know, which is organized by the Linux Foundation. Um, and there are lots of other legal forums that uh, educate lawyers on licenses and engineers as well today. But now well, Linus used um, GPL v2, right? That was what he used to open source uh, Linux. So what was the major change with the v2 version of the, the license? I could not give you yes. the specifics. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I could not give you the specifics. Um, there is a, a curveball. That's yeah. right. We, there is a V3 today. Uh, mm -hmm. I would highly recommend going to uh, the GPL website or the Software Freedom Conservancy website because they have a really nice write-up on um, you know, the differences between the different licenses and the different freedoms. I think everyone needs to know what the four freedoms of open source are. And the open source initiative, which also reviews licenses and and uh, declares them open source or not, is also a great website to go to, to understand uh, what the acceptable licenses are today, um, because there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of licenses, as you can imagine. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the Linux Foundation itself. Okay, so the, the, you, uh, you're on the board, you're the, the chair of the board for it. So let's talk about what, why was it created in the first place? Uh, that's a great question. I think it was around um, 2000, 2001 that the Linux Foundation came into being. And before that, it used to be open source development labs. And there was a separate organization called Free Standards Group, FSG and OSDL. Both of them came together in 2000 and became the Linux Foundation. And the history is... Um, companies that were beginning to start using open source and start getting involved in open source really wanted uh, an organization that could promote and safeguard uh, the development of Linux and could make it enterprise grade and enterprise ready um, and not, uh, and, and to kind of really invest in the mat maturity and the maturation, if you will, of Linux. That was one big um, objective. The second objective was to find a neutral and safe home, if you will, for Linus Torvalds to uh, be in so that he would not be under, the, under any one company and be swayed by any one company's agenda, but to be in a neutral home and drive the uh, direction of Linux in a neutral home. So the Linux Foundation really created a lot of um, infrastructure for hosting projects in a neutral way. Uh, the governance and the rules around governance, community, uh, communications, legal frameworks, et cetera. And that became um, you know, the center, if you will, for all Linux activity. And then you got involved, uh, when, did you, when did you join the board? I joined the board. I've, I've been involved in the Linux Foundation since the early days, since almost um, you know, my Silicon Graphics days and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, I remember going to um, small member summits in uh, the Kabuki Hotel in San Francisco. Uh, it used to be a few hundred you know, geeks uh, like me, and um, it was very small and intimate. Um, today, of course, the, the, the CNCF, which is part of the Linux Foundation, has like, uh, I don't know, 50, 60,000 people attending events. Uh, I joined the board uh, in 2016 
uh, as an independent director and as a community director. So the board has member directors who um, really come in at a platinum level to the, to the Linux Foundation and hence they get a board seat as well. And then there are a number of us who are independent directors coming in to speak on behalf of community, on behalf of diversity, et cetera. So we have, I think about four or five independent directors and we have one of the only boards that has uh, six or seven women uh, on the board, which is I think uh, really astonishing. And it's an extremely well-run board uh, which oversees um, hundreds of uh, projects and thousands of members. I was surprised to see Node.js on there, for example. So there's a lot of things I wouldn't think are part of the Linux, um, you know, foundation uh, or sponsored by the Linux Foundation, and yet they are. Um, so um, let's see here. You've got, um, you know, all these distributions of Linux, right? So you've got, you know, the, um, you know, Ubuntu and you name it. Um, how do you deal with that? How do, how do they keep track of all these distributions? It feels like there's a new distribution every couple of years or even months in some cases. The, uh, the foundation really cares about the kernel mainly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it cares about the kernel and any contributions from a hardware perspective to uh, get the kernel to work on you know, some different hardware. And certainly industries will come and submit contributions to have the kernel support a supercomputing requirement or an embedded requirement or a real-time requirement, et cetera. But we don't worry about the distributions. That's downstream from us. That's something that uh, distribution vendors or distribution makers uh, care about. And everyone starts with you know, the kernel and then they add their packages and they make it you know, their own. But you know something you said about Node.js is worth kind of revisiting. And you said you were surprised that Node.js was in the Linux Foundation. While we initially started off with the kernel and the Linux um, itself, um, soon what happened was because it was such a successful project, uh, other groups started coming and saying, can we host our project here? So soon you had uh, things like carrier grade Linux, and then you had uh, automotive grade Linux. Then you had uh, the Yocto project, which is an embedded Linux building system. And then you had so many other projects coming in, networking projects, et cetera. So today you're right, you'll see the broadest variety of open source projects there from cloud to AI, to healthcare, to energy, uh, and to frankly, uh, something like the Academy Software Foundation, which we are members of uh, from a Comcast perspective. And that's around the entertainment industry and how mm -hmm. we create software in the entertainment industry. Who are some of the current movers and shakers? Like who are the people that really uh contribute uh, that, that you'd like to let people know exist and what they do? Certainly Greg KH, right? Greg uh, Crowhartman is frankly the number two for the kernel and he does a lot of the, uh, the uh, sustaining uh, distribution for uh, the kernel. And Linus is still involved, but Linus is you know the final kind of decision maker, but uh, everybody else um, is involved in um, in making it work, right? And then um, one of my favorite people also is Shawa Khan, S-H-A-U-H. -H. Uh, Shawa has been a kernel uh, developer for a very long time. And she is now a fellow at the Linux Foundation and she is one of the kernel developers uh, in the Linux Foundation. Another person that I think is, um, is in a very interesting role is Priyanka Sharma. And Priyanka is the general manager of the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, uh, which is one of the largest foundations and projects after Linux. So uh, Ken, if you think Linux was successful, you of course know Kubernetes was super, super successful. Oh, yeah. So the whole Cloud Native Compute Foundation has been uh, extremely successful. All right, so let's talk about some of the more uh, novel uses of Linux. Um, you know, what, what might we find surprising about 
where Linux lives and how pervasive it is. I think you all uh, posted a tweet recently on uh, how the Mars Perseverance um, right, ro uh, used Linux and our open source mm -hmm. components. Uh, I think that's one of the big uses. Certainly all supercomputers in the world use Linux today. Uh, I would say, let's see my cheat sheet here. Um, frankly, all of our phones, our set-top boxes, um, just millions of devices, including uh, IoT type of devices, which are very small and, you know, uh, sensor type of devices all use Linux. So it's, it's pretty cool to, to kind of say, hey, if, if you are living and breathing today, you are in some way touching Linux uh, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I, it had such a huge inroad in containers, you know, be, even before Kubernetes, like most of the containers were Linux driven. And then there was always, there was, there was this goal to make the thinnest, smallest distribution of Linux, you know, Alpine Linux and other, other versions of it. So it's been pervasive in, in the container space. Um, not to throw a curve at all, but we were talking about like the cloud native angle, right? So, you know, one of the challenges we've been kicking around and talking about is as companies like Amazon and Google and others are starting to do cloud native services like uh, Lambdas and things like that, it gets hard to tell, you know, whether you're running something that you know about underneath. They might start with an API that looks like it might have run a certain way, but you could change the way it's implemented. But it seems like, uh, at least from the Amazon side, they're still really committed to Linux in the back end of those services, right? Yes, absolutely. In fact, all of the cloud vendors are part of the, the LF and um, work very closely with the open source program offices at Amazon, at Google, at Microsoft. And open source is very, very crucial to their innovation pipeline, frankly. Uh, I think all innovation will continue to, to happen in open source uh, where people have an itch to scratch and solve the problem. And then when it becomes broadly adopted and becomes a, more of a mainstream project, often cloud vendors then convert it into a service and it becomes a service and services are convenient. So people consume more and more services. But I think open source will continue to be uh, fueling their innovation engine. And, and frankly, from a development tools perspective also, most of us use open source development tools. So all of the cloud vendors continue to use open source tools for uh, doing their development work as well. So I, I see it as symbiotic and, and working hand in hand uh, to um, you know, innovate and move technology along. Okay, so um, let's talk a bit about diversity and inclusion. Uh, I know that's one of your passions. Um, so how can we get the society be, be more open and diverse for open source contributors? And, and you know, diversity, particularly uh, women in engineering in companies alone has been pretty low. It's about 18%, 19% typically. Mm -hmm. And in open source, it's been worse. It's been less than 10%. And, and underrepresented has been in the single digits as well. Um, and it's a problem. And partly it's, it's safety, um, making communities safe and um, comfort, uh, trustworthy, meaning um, that, you know, that you don't feel attacked or you don't feel uh, uh, that you will not be accepted. Uh, because as you know, it evolved in, in a very organic fashion without too many guidelines or too many um, you know, structures around it. So there's a lot of tribal knowledge in, in open source in terms of how projects get started, how do you join a project. And there are many old timers who've always been in, in these projects for a very long time. So opening the doors to me means A, making it safe and easy to navigate projects, right? even discovering which project should I get involved in, which project is safe to get involved in. Uh, you want to look at code of conduct, you want to look at contribution guidelines, you wanna look at, do they offer mentorship programs? Do the uh, maintainers, uh, have they established 
that diversity of contribution is important to them. So I think some of the systems we have in place now like GitHub and others are making it much more transparent to people on uh, best practices uh, for projects, how to create an inclusive project, how to make uh, welcome people into the project, et cetera. So that is important. The second important thing to me to making it more diverse and welcoming diversity is acknowledging that you need all kinds of contributions in open source, not just code, right? Uh, you yeah. need people who with governance skills, you need people with license and legal skills, you need people with documentation. And it takes a huge community to actually put on an event or to communicate uh, and do a blog or a podcast like you're doing. And so all of these pieces matter to making open source successful and vibrant. So I think these are the two big ones that I can think of. And many institutions like the Linux Foundation is offering mentorships, is making sure that there's a code of conduct in all of the projects that they support, uh, providing an escalation path for issues. Um, it's not where it needs to be across the world, but I'm seeing some positive uh, changes happening to uh, people getting involved in open source. That, that's good news that at least you're seeing the progress begin. Um, yes. And, you know, um, we were talking about female tech innovators. And we were kind of pre pre interviewing for some of this stuff. And, you know, there's some names that come to mind for you. I know uh, one of the ones that I had on, on mine was Jesse Frizzell, for example. So there's a lot of people uh, we could talk about uh, that uh, have made major strides uh, as women in technology. Um, so Jesse, for example, she's uh, what is that project called Oxide Computer, right? That's her her main thing. So she is one of the founders of Oxide Computer making basically cloud scale hardware, which I think is great. You know, they're, they're working on a whole set of like rack mount hardware that you would normally get on AWS or Google Cloud that you can purchase. And then the entire backplane of it and control of it is written in things like Rust. So there are definitely a lot of people you can follow. I would recommend her absolutely. Um, what are some of the other people that you've had and you've had them speak at Comcast, for example, that we should get to know? Um, Jesse is, is, is fantastic yeah. and she gets the ethos of developers and, um, you know, if you want to learn more about good software development practices, she's a, a really good person to follow. Um, I would say there are a number of women, uh, that I admire and respect Denise Cooper, who started the inner source commons, um, console, you know, foundation, she's run open source pro programs at Sun and also at PayPal. And she's done a lot of work with the Apache Foundation. She's just someone who's enriched open source for a very long time. That's, that's one of her callings in life, you know, is, is to do that. Stormy Peters is another great person to follow. Stormy runs the open source office at Microsoft. Uh, she's been involved in Mozilla. She's run the HP open source office. Uh, she's a developer advocate. She's a, a really terrific person. Deb Nicholson is another great person to follow. Uh, she goes by bacon and uh, pineapple or something like that on Twitter. <laughs> she's got the most Brittany. interesting um, handle on Twitter. But Deb Nicholson used to be uh, at the Software Freedom Conservancy. Now she's at the Open Source Initiative. She's doing some amazing things there. Uh, Angie Jones, who will be speaking at the uh, Philly event, is amazing. Elizabeth Cramback, who works at IBM, is fantastic. I love Elizabeth. She is uh, in the main, um, mainframe side of IBM, uh, advocating open source in the mainframe area. She grew up as a system admin. She grew up in Philly. Uh, she's a Philly girl, so uh, I, I think she's amazing. Um, she's someone to follow. I, I completely agree with you, Ken. Um, I think it's important for us to diversify our networks. We need to follow diverse people on Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, and get to know their point of view uh, and appreciate the fact that there are many faces to open source, there are many faces to technology. So thank you for the opportunity. Sure, and also on just, uh, there was a question here. I put a note in the chat with those names, but also we will, uh... We'll have this video online afterwards a couple of days later. 
Uh, and we'll make sure we put that in the show notes for the video as well. So that way people don't lose those names uh, for the person who's asking that, Danica. There you go. Um, <laughs> uh, we typed at the same time. So uh, so let's talk a bit on the other side of this. So from, uh, you know, from consuming and, and uh, you know, accessing technology, you know, digital equity is, a, is, is a, another important thing. Um, so let's talk a bit about digital equity and how you at Comcast and Comcast itself is really trying to help bring up uh, the access to technology for, for people who normally wouldn't have access to it. And boy, did we did we all learn how important digital equity is this past year, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. The pandemic just brought it front and center for all of us. Uh, it became our lifeline for buying groceries to uh, doing Zoom calls with our family to uh, studying for the kids to get their education to doing work. Um, and it's critical. It's so critical. And you one at once upon a time you could say, hey, it's only for you know doing certain things, but today it's to live. Yeah. And so it is essential. It's a lifeline. Uh, and Comcast has been doing a lot of work in this area, as you know, Ken. Uh, I, I think one of the, the programs that I'm uh, very, very fond of is the Internet Essentials Program, where we have a very, very low cost uh, internet line and subscription for those who cannot afford it. And I think in during the pandemic, I believe it even went free. And I believe there are 4 million uh, people on the internet essentials today uh, across 1 million households. So that's uh, pretty good. I know it's not enough and we keep working to make it you know, broader and broader. Um, the other program that I'm really, really uh, thrilled about is the lift um, zones that we launched. We launched it about two, three months ago, I think, and it's uh, about thousand lift zones across the country. And essentially what it is, is uh, working and partnering with nonprofits across the country, like churches and evening programs where children uh, go to um, and internet enabling those sites so mm -hmm. that kids can at least go to a safe, clean place and access uh, the internet to do their homework and not have to sit outside of McDonald's or, uh, you know, which is very sad. Yeah. And yeah. so I think the lift zones could really be a game changer. Um, and the third thing that I'm really proud of is uh, my team and I have been doing some of this, but across Comcast, we are looking at how can we volunteer as technologists at Comcast uh, with organizations like Code for Philly, uh, Black Boys Code, Black Girls Code, and make it a year long volunteer relationship where we would do it uh, every week or every month rather than just having a, a Comcast Cares Day for one day. And uh, you know, I think that will really, really help us to uh, sustain and continue that momentum. Because as you and I discussed, Ken, it's not enough to just give an internet connection. You need to also give equipment, which uh, I think lots of people have donated. Um, and third is to then help those kids use that effectively to make a living or to do their schoolwork or to discover opportunities in their life. Okay, great. The um... Comcast itself, let's talk a little bit more about uh, your role at Comcast in addition to your role in the Linux Foundation. Um, so how did you come to your role at Comcast? How'd you end up uh, doing this? It's, it's a great question because I, I've been a Comcast customer for years and years and years. I think since, I don't know, 91, 92 or something like that. I lived in the Silicon Valley area. So Comcast was our provider. So I've, I've always had internet and uh, entertainment from Comcast. And um, I had joined the Linux Foundation in 2016 and had, had successfully started an open source program office at SanDisk, which is, um, you know, uh, a, a storage company. And um, I think Comcast had been working in open source for a very long time, since I think 2000. Um, they'd been doing 
some great work in um, the set-top box area. Uh, the RDK project, for example, is uh, an open source stack for the set-top box that we have open sourced and anyone can download from RDKM and use it. Um, and so we have millions of people who use it. All of this happened before my time. So Comcast, when they started working on the X1 program, um, the uh, you know content distribution network, which is now called Apache Traffic Control, which we open sourced and lives at the Apache Foundation, had been doing so much open source that they had reached a point where they wanted to be a lot more thoughtful, intentional, um, and uh, systematic and strategic about open source. And so they reached out to me and asked if, if I was interested in uh, joining them to help them start an open source program office. And I was quite uh, excited about it because I had met Comcast at uh, the OpenStack Foundation and I had seen them win the super user uh, award for uh, their work with OpenStack and had seen that there was a strong intent and strong kind of focus on open source. So I was excited to join in 2017, Ken. And my team and I basically took all the good work that was already done and we started making it a lot more systematic across the company. Okay. And you have a lot of open source technologies you're working on. I'm sure at Comcast, you've got a lot of projects. You've mentioned, I think there were something like 200 different projects that people have contributed over time. So how do you keep track of all that stuff? That's right. So um, a lot of it is creating processes and systems that can scale across the company because we do have thousands of um, technologists across the company. So for instance, we have a really good process around requests for making contributions. Um, it's an online system. People can just submit a ticket and say, I want to contribute uh, X, Y, and Z to this project. And we set up a review online. We review the code that they want to contribute, make sure that it's secure, it's well-documented and uh, it's you know got the license to it and we've signed the CLA, et cetera. And we do it in like a day or two. Um, so it's extremely streamlined the whole ticketing system to contribute, for example. And so also consumption, we have guidelines that we have provided to all of our technologists. And what, what works is that the open source knowledge is not just in my office. What works is when every single developer knows um, that A, we are fully supportive of open source at, at the company, B, where to find the guidelines, follow the guidelines. And if they have any questions where they can come to, if they want to get involved in a project where they can come to, et cetera. So we've made it dead easy for uh, people to work in open source. It's, it's, it's a combination, I think, of systems as well as processes and guidelines. So um, coming towards the end of this, I uh, want to ask you uh, specifically, how did you get your start in software development? Yes. So you were an engineer originally, right? You, you were a full-time software engineer. How'd you get into this? So the, it's, it's a pretty interesting story. Um, I grew up in India, in Bangalore, India, um, which has now kind of become Silicon Valley of India, right? Um, and I actually grew up in the, you know, grew up at a time when software engineering and software developer was not a role I could aspire to because um, development was still in the early stages in those days. So I was thinking, uh, I was studying business and I was studying uh, accounting, finance and things like that. Um, and I think it was when I was about to graduate as, a friend of ours from the U.S. came to visit us in India and said, have you thought about going to college in the U.S.? And my dad was being the um, visionary that he has said to me, you know, you need to study computer science. If you go to the U.S., you should study computer science because that's the future. And I'm so glad he had that vision because this was the early 80s. Um, and so I, without knowing the complexities of what my college would be, 
um, enrolled in a master's program in computer science and spent the next three years doing my undergrad and grad credits for computer science, became a developer for Kodak uh, in Rochester, New York, and um, the rest is history. And thrilled and excited that I chose to become a computer scientist because it opened an entire different world for me and it's allowed me to travel uh, everywhere and have a good living and work with really, really smart people. Yeah, and it's clear that you have a, a strong passion and you're very interested in making things better for others through technology and through learning how to use technology. Um, do you want to answer any questions from the audience? I don't want to put you on the spot there, but. Sure, sure. I can okay. take questions from the audience. I may not always have the answer, but I'm happy sure. to. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> so if you have any questions as we kind of wrap this up, um, go ahead and type them in. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I still just am amazed at, at you know, how the uh, Linux uh, Foundation has been really, you know, doing so much work. Uh, just out of side side note, so you, you, I assume you have a lot of corporate sponsors that help run this, right? Or at yeah. least funded, I should say. Yeah, and 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 that's a great question. I, I before I answer that, I also wanted to acknowledge Fred Stutka. Yes, I Fred. Fred is is making a great comment, and I completely agree with him. The Python community, the Django community, um, and there's a couple of other communities that are so welcoming and so good. Those are role model communities for inclusion, uh, frankly. They, they've done a fantastic job. And it's because right from the top, you know, people have um, acknowledged how important diversity is. And yes, I, I did, I worked at Tripwire. I was uh, director of product management at that time. And I'm so glad Fred has been using uh, Tripwire since 2002. But coming back to your question, um, there are foundations which run as nonprofits, um, and you know, it's 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 a tough model because you don't have enough funding to carry on the work. Um, what the Linux Foundation did was to establish themselves as a trade association, five hundred one c six. So we get membership fees. Uh, from member companies and the fee is based on the size of the company and also its revenue, et cetera. So it's very fair to smaller companies and it, it makes sure that, you know, larger companies pay their fair share. So that's what's really helped us uh, run a fantastic organization um, with full-time staff and high quality staff and I've got to give a lot of credit to the leadership team at the Linux Foundation, like Jim Zemlin, Angela uh, Brown, who do a fantastic job of running, you know, the events and who uh, have put a lot of uh, energy and focus into developer education, uh, into events, into community, into, you know, creating consistent structures and, and even really clarifying a lot of legal issues and making sure uh, Linux was safe and sound. Where, where can we read and view your work? So like, where do you put out uh, writing and documents and things like that? A lot of my work, I, I do a lot of tweeting. So you will see me on Twitter at Nithya Ruff. You will also see a lot of our, a lot of my talks and a lot of writing that I've done uh, on our website, Comcast website, comcast.github.io. So if you go to comcast.github.io, you will also find all of the talks that we've done as a company, uh, all of the projects that we've open sourced. We also have open source uh, innovation grants that we offer as a company to universities and uh, projects. So you can see all of that there. And then frankly, if you go to YouTube and uh, Google Nithya Ruff, you should be able to find some of the talks that I've done in the past. Um, yeah. I just Googled with Google lowercase. Uh, I think it has to have a capital, there we go. Right. All right, great. Um, 
I think that'll do it. Let's see if there's going to be, has any questions real quick here. Danica has, has a nice comment. She said, uh, I, uh, Danica Pescavage, she said, I taught Red Hat Linux and Red Hat Enterprise Linux System Administration from 2000 to 2015. It was fun to hear you talk about this. It felt like it was back in my old world again for a bit. Yes. Uh, we, yep. We all miss teaching. I know I miss teaching. That's what I, I've been doing for years too. And it's uh, be nice to get together with people again in person once this is all over. Oh, hey, man. I just wanted to do a quick plug that the yeah. Linux Foundation is doing a lot of work to celebrate the 30 years of Tux, as you can see. So you can see the, the, uh, the background that I have came from them. And soon you should be able to download these backgrounds as well and, and start using them. And they're creating stickers and uh, giveaways and all kinds of stuff uh, in, um, uh, you know, that, that you can uh, buy. And they'll also do, be doing a number of celebrations uh, soon. Uh, and you can check out the store and the celebrations on their website in a, in, a, in a couple of days. In fact, they said to me, you can use it first. You will be the first one using it. And after that, we will announce it and we'll make it available. That's called beta testing. <laughs> so my, my colleague, Andrew Herzog, who's also on the call and listening to me talk, is asking, what is Tux's favorite type of cake? Boston cream pie or chocolate covered cheesecake? Gosh, what would Tux like? I don't know. I think Tux likes all kinds of cakes, don't you think? I think maybe, although I'm partial to chocolate covered, covered cheesecake myself. Yeah, that's, I, I think fish cake. Like yes. Has. yes, Scott, you're exactly right. Fish uh, cake. Oh, that's true because he's a penguin. Yeah, that totally makes sense. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much, Nithya. That was a great talk. Um, we will be putting this up. Uh, if you go to youtube.com slash chariot solutions, you'll see uh, the talk up there in a couple of days. Um, and again, we will preserve the, the links that we brought up in the talk and uh, any of the resources that you had mentioned in here, we'll make sure are put in, in the notes. Um, but we really appreciate you taking the time with us today. Thank you. My pleasure, Ken. Thank you and Tracy for inviting me and for celebrating Tux's 30th birthday. He's a young man, you know? He's just 30, that's <laughs> he's all. He's just 30, but, but he's chicken. already conquered the entire world. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank Bye. you very much. Take care.